The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Fight Colorectal Cancer webinar. Today, we're going to be just, uh, having uh, discussions about clinical trials, addressing myths, and finding trials. Um, my name is Sharon Worrell. I'm part of the Fight Colorectal Cancer team um, and excited for the webinar today. Next slide. Today's webinar, we have a number of amazing speakers. We have Dr. Angela Nich Nicholas, who's a family practice physician and a caregiver. Uh, Dr. Chris Curie, who's the Chief Medical Officer for Precision Biosciences. Winora John Johnson, a survivor and a Fight CRC research advocate. And Reese Garcia, Fight CRC's research advocacy manager. For those listening live, we will post the recording of the webinar on the Fight CRC website. Afterwards, after the webinar ends, give us about an hour or so, and then you can check back at fightcrc.org backslash webinar to find the recording and the slide deck from today. If you have questions during the session, please feel free to ask them real time using the panel on the right side of your screen. You can type your questions in there, and we have some dedicated time at the end of the session to go through questions and answers. If you have Twitter, please tweet along. You can follow online using the hashtag CRC webinar. After the webinar, you will receive a link to, the, to watch the recording um, and a quick survey um, about the webinar itself. Next slide, please. Fight CRC offers a number of free patient resources, including our Tab Booty podcast, uh, a number of mini magazines on specific topics like clinical trials, and of course, uh, we have Your Guide in the Fight, which is our guide for stage three and stage four colorectal cancer patients. The information and services provided by Fight CRC are for general informational purposes only. The information and services are not intended to be substitutes for professional medical advice, diagnoses, or treatment. If you are ill or suspect that you are ill, please see a doctor immediately and in an emergency, call 911 or go to the nearest emergency room. Fight CRC never recommends or endorses any specific physicians, products, or treatments for any condition. And here's our wonderful speakers. Um, Dr. Chris Heary, as I noted before, is the Chief Medical Officer for Precision Biosciences. Uh, prior to joining uh, their team, he served as the Chief Medical Officer of Bavaria Nordic. And before that, Dr. Harry served as the Director of the Clinical Trials Group at the Laboratory of Tumor Immunology and Biology at the National Cancer Institute in Maryland. Um, we're so excited to have uh, Dr. Harry here today um, to speak about clinical trials. We also have um, Dr. Nicholas, who's a board certified family physician. Um, she's also the Medical and Administrative Director of Einstein Physicians Montgomery and a member of Einstein Physicians Montgomery Management Committee and the Quality and Compliance Committee. Um, super excited to have Dr. Nicholas here as well. Next slide. And our other two presenters today are Winora Johnson. Um, she's a three-time cancer survivor. She's a volunteer research patient advocate with fight colorectal cancer. Um, a U.S. Navy veteran, and a caregiver and provider as well. Uh, Winora began working closely with Fight CRC um, in 2011 after her stage 3B colon cancer diagnosis. Um, she's a caregiver for her mother and her brother, um, who are also cancer survivors as well. Uh, Reese joined Fight CRC in August 2017 and has been serving in the role of research advocacy manager. She's passionate about working with cancer survivors and people that empower survivors. And she currently oversees the research advocacy training and support program and coordinates the colorectal cancer research related campaigns nationwide. Uh, she earned her master's, master's of public health at Colorado School of Public Health at the University of Colorado, Denver and has spent a majority of her time working with disadvantaged global and rural communities to overcome health disparities. Next slide. And I will let uh, the, the presenters take over from here. Uh, thank you so much for being here and for your time today. Dr. Nicholas, take it away. Great, thanks so much. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, my role as a caregiver and um, it, it, it in some ways
ways clashes a bit with my role as a family physician. I've been a family physician for um, 27 years now. Um, I have a role as um, the chief medical officer at Einstein Healthcare System in, Phil in the Philadelphia area. Um, and my husband was um, diagnosed back in November of 2013 at age 45. Um, he, he has a very interesting story because he had a week of symptoms. He saw his family doctor. He saw a GI physician that same day. Two days later, had a colonoscopy and was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer um, on that day. And so, like all um, family members and caregivers, you know, it was obviously a, a huge shock. We were never expecting to hear that he had colon cancer. Um, and so we, we were immediately thrown into a world that, while I was very familiar with, was also very unfamiliar with. Um, it's, it's different being on the other side. And it really gave me um, an appreciation for what those of you who are not in the medical profession really go through as you sort of navigate your way through oncology appointments and surgery appointments. Um, and you know, immediately I started reading, you know, what, what do we need to do? What's next? What's next? What's next? And, and really, um, I'll, I'll take you a bit through John's treatment plan because it, it was pretty standard. You know, we, we went to standard of care chemotherapies. He had um, 10 rounds of full fox um, plus uh, bevacizumab, Avastin, and then had surgery. Um, he, when he was diagnosed, he had nine liver mats and over 20 lung mats in addition to his primary colon cancer, which was um, in his sigmoid, rectosigmoid colon. Um, and it, the chemo worked great, actually, and shrunk um, most of his liver tumors. A lot of his lung tumors were gone, um, and his, um, his colon mass was shrunk to about three centimeters. And so we felt really great about that. He had surgery. He then went back on chemo for another couple of months. Then he had a lung surgery. Um, he recovered from that, went back on chemo um, for another couple of months. Um, actually went back on chemo for another 10 treatments, 12 treatments. And then we're sort of now, okay, now what? Now what are we gonna do? And started looking at mechanical treatments for his, um, for his cancer. So he had ablations of of his, um, some of his lung mats that weren't taken care of by the surgery. He had radiation to one of his lung mats that was not um, easily accessible by the radiofrequency ablation. He had radiation to a new liver um, metastases that he had. Um, but that's when I started thinking about clinical trials. And um, in my mind, clinical trials were you know, we're not for the very, very ill. You know, the best time to get into clinical trials was when he was actually doing well and feeling very healthy. And and I and I need to say that during that time, um, my husband played golf. You know, multiple times a week. He was very active. He became active at Fight CRC and and really was you know physically doing actually pretty well. Um, I started investigating clinical trials, kept bringing, you know, this trial or that trial to oncologists, and he kept saying, not ready yet, not ready yet. Let's, let's exhaust standard of care, and then let's decide if we need to do a trial. You know, he kept saying, if, if, if. Um, at the point of time, though, where we, you know, chemo stopped working, and, um, you know, we continued to have growth of his metastases and new metastases, um, we felt like that was a good time to start. And, I started really getting involved on um, the Colon Town webpage with the clinical trials group. Um, and, and at that point, the clinical trials trial finder was uh, an Excel spreadsheet. You know, we would all contribute to it. We would talk about trials. We would ask each other about the trials. But, um, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of technology behind the trial finder. Um, I would look at that. I would download the spreadsheet probably every three or four weeks. I would look at it. At the same time, our oncologist said, um, you know, it's really, we, we found this, we have a trial here at the institution that we were receiving care at. Um, I think this would be a really good trial for John. And, and it was a KRAS, um, uh, targeted KRAS treatment, um, which is one of the mutations that John had, and we thought that seemed like a good fit. Um, and, and it's important to identify, 
you know, it's important to, to state that um, I opened up the conversation very early on in his treatment about clinical trials. You know, I was not seeing clinical trials, again, as treatment of last resort, um, but I was seeing clinical trials as in, even an adjunct to the standard of care treatment that he was getting and was continuing to ask about what about the other institutions in Philadelphia? What else do they have? And, and the networks are, you know, the, the oncologists typically work together in, in cities and kind of know what's out there in other, at other places. Um, started to realize, though, that um, oncologists really know about what's in their institution. Well, they have to reach out to find out what's at other institutions. I live in Philadelphia. Um, there are a couple of major medical centers. Um, I was at a National Cancer Institute designated um, center, which I feel is very, very important, especially for patients who are thinking about clinical trials and for patients who are outside of the standard. In, in my mind, diagnosed at 45, um, John was very young for colon cancer, and I felt like we needed to be at a place where they saw others of him. It didn't make sense to me that he would be getting chemo next to somebody who was you know, 60 or 70. Um, you know, he was 45 and had stage four cancer, so I really wanted to be at a place that really had the latest and greatest. Um, what I realized was I had to start doing some things for us to get us to these clinical trials. Our oncologist knew what he knew, but he didn't know what he didn't know. He didn't know what was happening at MD Anderson. He didn't know what was happening at NIH, and that would be time for him to have to reach out to do that. And I thought, well, heck, I can do that too. And and that really, for me, was the was the clinical trial finder. So as as we in, in started in our first clinical trial. Um, and that was in June of um, 2016. Um, we, I started talking, we, we had to transfer oncologists because the principal investigator was a different oncologist. And this oncologist happened to be the um, physician who was leading the phase one clinical trials at the institution in which we received care. Um, so, so Clinical trials are, are, are broken out, and Dr. Heary, I think, will talk a little bit more about this, but phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, and, and I like to think of phase one trials as it's exper I mean, let's be honest, it's experimental treatment, but it's experimental treatment with good, sound science behind it, and, and we wouldn't be investigating and using these drugs together if we didn't think there was some science behind it. So maybe it worked in, mat in, in, in mice models or rat models. Maybe there was some science behind this drug targets this kind of behavior in cancer cells. Um, and now we need to investigate that, I that idea. And so the phase one trials are broken out into different separate phases. Sometimes there's something called a dose escalation phase where they're trying to figure out what's the right dose to give patients that's not going to cause toxicity but gets benefit. And then the second phase to that is, you know, is this is this going to show start to show some um, activity in, in killing the cancer cells. So so recognizing that this was, you know, all you know, fairly experimental. Um, we did this KRAS treatment, but I started to really earnestly look for trials. I found a trial and, and was talking to our oncologist about it, and he really helped to educate me. And his option, he, he said to me, well, you know what, why don't you, you know, get that spreadsheet and, and, you know, hone it down and look at some things. And we talked about some approaches. And then, like, the next time you come in for your appointment, bring in the spreadsheet. And, and that became our um, are the way that we manage John's appointments. To be honest, John used to joke that we didn't really need him at his appointments. He could just kind of sit in the corner or go down and get a cup of coffee, and the two of us would, would talk about trials and what was, what was next. I started to filter out the trials by location um, because, I mean, let's be honest, we live in Philadelphia. You know, would we travel every week to California? It, sure, we would. Um, was that practical or feasible? If there were other options closer, I would obviously want the option that was closer. So you have to think about that. Um, you know, what are the science? There are some trials that just he doesn't qualify for because he was he already had certain kinds of treatments, or this just wasn't the right treatment for him. So we'd filter those out, and then we'd narrow it down. And then I'd ask his oncologist to give me a comment on what he thinks. And so we would do that. Um, we we did that as he was in that 
that clinical trial that summer, um, he started to have growth on that trial. So then we went to the next trial. Um, we were fortunate to be chosen for a, a treatment at the National Institutes of Health. Um, that trial went on for a couple of months. He needed to have a surgery for that trial. Um, and then they needed to grow some cells. And unfortunately, those cells didn't grow. So then we're looking for another trial. And every time we went through the same cycle, I would bring down the clinical trial finder, I would start to filter and sort, I would take out the trials that we had already looked at that decided that that wasn't a good option, and then there was always more, there was always some newer ones, and there were always things I was hearing about, and um, and so I would try to target his treatments um, or, or the, the trials around those kinds of things. Um, the from from my perspective, you know, getting into the trial was the most anxiety-provoking part. So here's some suggestions that I would have. Um, what I would do is I would find, you know, I'd, I'd go on to, I'd take that trial number. There's always a clinicaltrial.gov number, and I'd go onto the website, and I'd use that number to find the trial. I would scroll down to the bottom and find the contact information. Um, I always had a list of, by date and by treatment, John's protocols, all of the things that he had done. I would have a copy of the latest lab results. I would have a copy of his latest CAT scan or imaging study. I would have, a, you know, the most recent copies of his surgery notes or procedure notes or whatever else he had done. And I would attach all of that to an email that was very friendly, very nice, very pleasant, um, and, you know, state, hey, I'm, you know, I'm looking for a trial. I saw this trial. I'm very interested in hearing more about it. Here's all the information for my husband. Um, would be happy to discuss at your earliest convenience. I will tell you, they never called me on the phone. They always sent emails back. And then I would start to go through the process with them. They would always want the last oncology note, which our oncologist office would gladly send. I'd just send them an email, and they would send an email to, or send that information off. But and then they would typically, if they were serious about um, including John in a trial, they would want to see the most recent copy of his CAT scan. So I always, whenever he had a CAT scan or an MRI, I would always, always, always get two copies of that right off the bat. This way I would always have one ready to go. And then anything that they wanted, I would FedEx and I would send to them and I would tell them, I've FedExed it, here's your tracking number, expect to have it the next day. Um, time did not, I did not waste any time in getting them, getting back the information that they needed to say. Um, sometimes they would determine that John wasn't appropriate for the treatment. Um, sometimes they would determine that, um, uh, that it just, for whatever reason, wasn't going to work. You know, it, he had something, again, that he was, um, it would, it would make him not qualify for that trial. Um, However, um, that I think the approach that I use of having all that information really helped to speed up the decision-making process. And I would typically have no more than five at a time going because I couldn't manage any more than five. That was my number. You know, you may have 10 or 12. Um, I was only able to manage about five at a time. And, and eventually we would, you know, come up with one or two that were options and I would you know, talk to his oncologist and he would make a recommendation, ba again, based on science or based on treatment, and then we would move on from there. Um, it, it, is, um, it is very anxiety provoking. I, I need to say from the, from the caregiver perspective, I really felt like I was um, a combination of spinning a roulette wheel as well as playing God, making a decision about what trial he was going to get. Um, and, and that was really a hard position for me to be in. On the other hand, um, I felt like I was obviously the, the best person to figure out for my husband what the, what the right treatment or uh, potential treatments would be for him. Um, we were fortunate um, you know, to, to have access to, again, to a lot of major medical centers. And in between, as we were trying to find these trials, we were also then visiting other medical centers, trying to get other opinions around what else should we do, what else could we treat, you know, what are the options that we have available to us. And um, about a year ago in uh, November, um, he became pretty, pretty critically ill. And um, however, at the same time, about two weeks before that, we found out that the 
treatment that the trial that he had been at National Institutes of Health had kept his cells and had been trying to grow them and actually had some opportunity for his cells. Um, so we were proceeding along a path of going back to that original trial that we had planned on with some nuances. They had changed the treatment protocols a little bit and changed the options a little bit. Um, and um, and then in the meantime, they had another vaccine trial that we were in. They enrolled us in at the same time because they thought John would be a good candidate for that. Um, unfortunately, his disease had progressed to the point where um, it was really not feasible for him to continue looking for clinical trials. And he passed in April. Um, but you know, I think we are. I am very comforted in knowing that the six trials that he participated in really have pa have have paved the way for others to potentially either receive that treatment or not receive that treatment you know we we have contributed to the treatment and to the to the treatment plans and the research um, that all of you who are looking for trials for your loved ones are now being able to um, potentially take part in um, the the Again, the, the the trial part of this and finding trials is 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 challenging, um, and and you have to go into it understanding that there's no there's no magic to this. Um, you know, you hope that you get stability. Um, my prayer and wish is that everybody gets cured from these trials. Um, but you know, we we know people, and I know lots of people who are who are you know, in, in have been in multiple trials, really looking for the right thing to hopefully stabilize. I, I think that the the trials themselves, um, the physicians, the clinicians that are involved in the trials um, are really trying to pick the right patients for the trials. And that's the one thing that, that you also have to think about. You know, they they really want to have patients that are are, you know, I don't want to say, uh, let's say not doing poorly, um, because they need you to be able to come back for appointments when they need you to come back for appointments. Um, they need you, you know, some of John's trials, he needed to have three liver biopsies over six weeks. Uh, you know, I, it's sort of annoying, you know, it's a liver biopsy. Why do we need to do this again? Because, but that's what the treatment protocol required. So, so you have to think about that and plan for that. So as you're, as you're making your list of trials and as you're talking to the investigators around the trials, you really want to ask, you know, what are the requirements? How often do I need to come? Um, what kind of um, expectations do you have in, in follow-up medications or follow-up um, imaging studies? Um, you know, so, um, you know, one trial at NIH required him to be at the National Institutes of Health every other week for, you know, uh, every other week or every third week, un you know, until we eventually stopped the trial because he had some growth. So, so um, you know, National Institutes of Health is a two and a half hour drive from our house, not a big deal. Um, but if you live in California, that's a big deal. You know, you're taking a plane every other, every couple of weeks to get there. Um, so you really want to think about, you know, what, what are the, what are the things I'm going to have to plan for in my life? Um, and then, you know, plan that into the, the options for what trials am I going to, am I going to look for? Um, and I think, again, you know, I can't underscore enough, you know, look early, look often, um, because the trials are changing literally every week. There are new trials and new approaches. Um, you know, partner with your oncologist. Your oncologist knows what they know, but they don't know the world of clinical trials for stage four colorectal cancer. Most of us go to go to oncologists who hopefully specialize in GI cancers, um, but but even they don't know all of the trials that are out there. So you know, be an informed consumer when you're talking about clinical trials. Go to the um, go to the Fight CRC website, download the trial finder, start filtering and sorting and and using the trial finder to look for trials, and and watch you know, the the webinars that are already posted around um, around looking for trials because I think it's going to help you understand a little more around what are the things that you need to know and how do you approach these trials with your oncologist. I, 
I am incredibly fortunate that our oncologist who, uh, you know, interesting, I don't know if I actually said this, but he wasn't a GI oncologist. Um, he happened, as I had stated, he happened to be responsible for these one clinical trials um, at the institution that we received our care. And um, when at the point that John was in clinical trials, his feeling was, you know, I, I can help you with the science as much as anybody else, you know, and I, you know, actually, we were sort of his, I don't want to say pet GI patient, but we, we were we were different than the rest of his patients. He primarily did lung and head and neck cancers, and um, and actually the lungs were the area that he John was having the most issue with. So it kind of fit together. Um, but our oncologist was lovely in in participating with us in this and really being a partner and and fascinated by the trial finder that we have for stage four colorectal cancer because it's really not something that is um, is well is available for other um, for other cancers. So at this point, I think I'll pause. Um, I know we have others to have um, lots of other um, great insights and things to contribute to, and I am looking forward to hearing them. And we're again, as um, as everyone said, we're happy to take uh, questions uh, during the during the webinar. Awesome. Thank you so much, Angie. That was extremely insightful, and you know you have such extensive experience going through trials. So we really appreciate you sharing what um, you and John went through with that. Um, and I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, John has contributed so much to research through this process. Um, so thank you again for sharing. And like you, you mentioned, we'll have time at the end um, for questions for our presenters. But as a reminder, feel free to use the chat, uh, chat box function to type them in throughout the webinar. Um, so with that, I'm going to punt to our next presenter, um, Dr. Heary. Dr. Heary, it is all you. Hey, uh, so thanks, and thank you for the great lead-in from Dr. Nicholas. It's actually um, nice to know that I don't have to cover most of the, I think, the major myths that that are floating out there about clinical trials, because she gave us a first-hand account of what that looks like from the patient and the caregiver perspective. But I'll just highlight a few of the things and, and maybe point out where, um, as a patient, sort of just going through things for the first time, you you might be able to create some opportunities for yourself or for your loved one. So the first thing to point out is uh, is that point about clinical trials only being a last resort. I I, um, I think it's really important to emphasize that that this is one of those things that people have thought for years. It's really not based on the reality of, of where most clinical trials are heading. In fact, most clinical trials, in order to demonstrate that a therapy works effectively, have to either be compared directly to standard of care or, in, in some cases, are combined with standard of care and, combined to the standard, and, and then compared to the standard of care. And so it is actually, in, in many cases, impossible to demonstrate that a new therapy is effective if you were only waiting until there were no other therapeutic options available, because uh, you wouldn't fall into the category of patients that are capable of receiving standard of care because you would have already received it. And so some of the very best things that are out there are usually in those late stage clinical trials. And so I am a major advocate, um, especially when speaking with patients, of looking at what is the standard of care and are there any therapeutic options and clinical trials that allow me to take that standard of care and potentially receive another therapy that might improve the outcome? So for instance, um, we heard that uh, Dr. Nicholas's husband had previously received standard upfront chemotherapy, which most people do, but there are a number of clinical trials that will take that standard upfront chemotherapy and either change the schedule or combine it with another agent to try to maximize benefit. And in some cases, we're looking for very specific signals of certain subtypes of colorectal cancer. Some of the subtypes that are the most difficult to, to treat and, the, and the, the worst prognosis are the ones that we want to enroll in that study. And what that means is that you actually have to do um, some other tests to know if, if your cancer fits those criteria of, of sort of being super high risk so that you find out if you're eligible to go on to the clinical trial. So that's a really important one. 
and I, I don't think we can overemphasize that, um, that that it's important to look sort of all throughout the process at, at what else is out there and whether it allows you to get what you were already going to get and maybe something a little bit better. Um, I'd also emphasize the point that was raised about having to look yourself and having to do a lot of this work on your own unless you can find a physician whose entire job is to look for clinical trials. You put yourself in a, in a very difficult position just relying on one person's opinion about what clinical trials are out there for you that might be a good fit. So it's, it's very labor intensive, it's a lot of work, and that is what the clinical trial finder is intended to address. So we, we have to thank um, Fight Colorectal Cancer and others who have contributed to the clinical trial finder. It's a major resource for patients and it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing to have available. And we find that even physicians are using it uh, to try to get more insight into options they can provide for their patients. And then um, maybe the last point I'll just bring up is that um, given the fact that in many cases we don't know which therapy is likely to be the one to help you, um, I think the point that Dr. Nicholas raised around convenience is a really important one. I don't think convenience is the only thing, but I think when you, if you narrow your search down to say three or four options, and one of them is right down the street, and the other one is across the country, it is a perfectly reasonable thing to make a decision based on logistics and just what's gonna fit your lifestyle best, especially if you're feeling relatively well overall um, and, and you know that every trial you might try has a maybe one in four chance of being helpful to you, um, given that you're not gonna be able to predict which one it is that's gonna help you most, it just makes sense to do the one that fits into your lifestyle. And there's nothing wrong with making decisions based on what is most convenient for you as the patient and the caregiver. Um, now, if there's something that looks like it's definitely gonna work, obviously, go out of your way to do that. Um, but we also have to be careful about how we define what is working. So uh, for some patients, a therapy working means buying six more months of, of life so that you can get to a graduation or a wedding or something like that. For some people, it means trying to achieve a cure. And so the last point I will make is that it's important to upfront to decide what, how do you characterize what you want to get out of a treatment. If you know that you want a cure, you should be looking for something that's relatively aggressive. And that means you can tolerate more logistical problems. It means you might be willing to tolerate more risk in terms of adverse events. If you want to improve your overall quality of life and live a little longer, that's a different, it's a different equation. And so it's important to think through those things ahead of time before you go to meet with the clinical trial site um, and before you start looking at the clinical trial finder, try to decide what is it that I wanna get out of this and, and how would I, what am I willing to sacrifice in order to achieve that? So I'll, I'll stop there because I think um, Dr. Nichols covered so many important points already, um, and again, I'm happy to, to take questions as well later. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Heary. That was um, very helpful and really insightful as well. Um, I think, you know, some of the big points you both make is that patients can start looking for trials early and then really taking into account that quality of life component is, is um, up to the patient but is worth considering as well. Um, so before I um, punt to our next presenter, who um, is not only a research advocate, but also works very closely with um, the Fight CRC Trial Finder as well, I wanted to um, provide a little bit of background, which I know it's been touched on briefly throughout this presentation, um, on the Trial Finder. So the Fight CRC Trial Finder was um, developed in 2015, or I'm sorry, 2017. And at the time, Dr. Tom Marcillier, who was both a stage four survivor um, and a researcher was curating trials um, from clinicaltrials.gov into an Excel worksheet like Angie mentioned, and this was posted online. Um, once we realized the impact that was having on patients, we partnered with both Dr. Tom and Flatiron Health, um, and Fight CRC created the trial finder that you see today. Um, this serves as an online tool for patients specifically with microsatellite um, stable colorectal cancer um, with stage four. Uh, to find trials that Tom deemed as a reduced chance of failure and the greatest potential benefit. Um, and this was created based on a strategic logic flow that he created at the time, but this has also grown and evolved over the years. Um, in 2019, hearing from our community that 
you know, this was accessed a lot of times on phones in doctor's offices. Um, we launched the mobile app version. Um, and currently the tool is um, being further developed based on what we're hearing from our community. Um, one aspect that makes this tool extremely unique, and this is what we'll get into next with our um, next presenter, is that uh, it is patient curated. It's one of the only tools that are patient curated. Um, and on top of that, every day an algorithm is pulling in trials from clinicaltrials.gov and these patient curators are sorting through those um, every day to make sure that the trials are update, updated. And this is where um, people like Winora come in, are curators. So currently Fight CRC has six research advocates that are curating the tool as level one curators. And what that means is they're sorting through the initial list that's being pulled by clinicaltrials.gov and, and really taking out those trials that aren't necessary for late stage MSS colorectal cancer patients. Um, currently we have two level two curators. So that is our very own Maya Walker and then um, Connor who is out of uh, Kentucky. And they go through and they, they do more of a high level um, uh, looking at the trials and making sure that these trials really are um, following that flow that Dr. Tom developed and are, are relevant and pertinent to these patients. Um, like I mentioned, every day we have these curators going through this list, so it's constantly being updated. And we do work closely with experts in the field, um, like Dr. Harry and our immunotherapy working group, um, to keep the tool up to date and the curation um, process relevant. And like I mentioned, this is our only patient curated um, clinical trial finder. So it's very unique in the sense that, you know, patients are the, are the, uh, are the individuals at the heart of this tool. Um, so I don't want to spend any more time going through the background of that. Um, I am going to let Winora, who is one of our curators, talk about her story and her experience curating uh, clinical trials. So that is all you, Winora. Thank you, Reese. Uh, my name is Winora Johnson. And in 2011, at the age of 45, I was diagnosed with uh, colorectal cancer stage 3B. But the one thing that saved my life was actually a fit test. So just taking an average fit test from my doctor's office is what uh, caught my initial diagnose. And from there, um, I was able to uh, uh, complete uh, a colonoscopy. And then finally, I was told that I had uh, stage 3B cancer. So a little bit more about me. Um, I was had no evidence of disease for at least four years. And then my oncologist suspected that I was Lynch syndrome. So she wanted me to take a genetic test. I took a genetic test in 2016 and it confirmed that I was indeed a Lynch syndrome um, person and that um, I had an 80% chance of getting endometrial cancer. My oncologist and gynecologist, we all talked and decided that we could do something in a preventive manner. So I had a total hysterectomy at that point, but only to be told I have already had endometrial cancer stage one. And uh, fortunately for me, um, surgery was an option that uh, provided um, the step to take care of that cancer. And then in 2017, I had a small pimple that I thought was on my back that turned out to be two inches of basal cell carcinoma removed. So for me, being a Lynch syndrome uh, person means constant visits and follow-ups with my oncologist that I do every six months. And in my uh, involvement with Fight CRC goes back to 2014. I started out, it started out with just initial requests of asking about my story. And I shared my story with them. And then in 2015, I applied to become a RAT. And that's basically a research advocate training support volunteer. And um, I attended various um, call on Congress events. And in 2017, I was asked to be a clinical trial curator. Um, one of the things that Fight CRC has guided me with in my advocacy role is clinical trials training and a lot of policy training. And uh, that's allowed me to become actively involved with other organizations such as NCCS, uh, PCORI. Uh, I'm now on the PCORI Clinical Trials Review Panel. So I, I use the analogy of Fight CRC being my parent. And after a while, after you've grown up and become an adult, you move out the house and you move on to do better things. And that's exactly what Fight CRC has allowed me to do. It has allowed me um, a lot of opportunities 
uh, like uh, creating a poster, visiting labs to see HeLa cells, and then just um, basically reaching out to be a volunteer for, for, for other organizations that are helping in the fight CRC uh, environment. So if I could go on a little bit to becoming a clinical trial curator, um, I actually began, I didn't begin curating until the following year of 2018, but in 2017, um, there had to be a little bit of training involved, and there were monthly meetings, and from there, we were told to cure, we would have a, uh, a curating rate of six to eight weeks. So I and a, another partner would curate every six to eight weeks. Um, Reese provided a um, great flow chart to assist us with keeping the, the clinical trials uh, uh, from the various stage of either being rejected or going to be triaged to go to the next level. And then um, clinical trial tips were um, provided at every monthly meeting that we have. And for, for example, um, on the call, um, if we had an issue with a particular trial, uh, we were then asked to, you know, uh, how would this fit in the flow chart? So the flow chart was constantly uh, being reinvented, and now it's like this really great checklist that provides um, uh, you the ability to truly understand what you're curating. Now, as teams, we work together. Uh, at least two of us at a time. And we also use the Google Classroom, a way to post questions or concerns. And even at times there were um, articles that became of interest when it came to immunotherapy treatments. So those were big, uh, big helps. And then um, we also uh, decided to do a clinical trials of the month. So while we were curating, if we came across a trial that we considered was very, very important, uh, it would be used as a uh, clinical trial of the month uh, to encourage maybe uh, patients who were looking at them to uh, to, to re really consider this particular trial. As a clinical trial curator, what I've learned is that I have a stronger knowledge of what MMR, MSI high is, and that um, from this, targeted therapies can be created uh, have been created um, to help those who have late stage um, colorectal cancer. Um, as um, both doctors have previously mentioned, some of those clinical trial, trial drugs, uh, such as Avastin and Cotrudo and Optivo, have been created out of these, um, these trials and have been successful with some patients. So for me, I, I'm excited about being a curator. Um, understanding that there are over 300,000 trials that is in a clinical trial side gov process, but I can help another person come along and who, who, who has been diagnosed as late stage and give them direct access to exactly what they're looking for. Um, it just means a lot in this role. And I think that's all that I can say, unless Reese wants to um, add something else. Thank you, Nora. That's that's very insightful. <laughs> You're, you know, from creators who are on the front line of this trial finder that that is being utilized um, nationally. So I know we're running short in time, um, Dr. Huri. I wanted to see if you had anything else to add um, in terms of challenges to clinical trial enrollment and ways to address them that you hadn't touched on already. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the one of the most difficult things I think about clinical trial enrollment, both for patients and for physicians, is matching up location and, and needs of a clinical trial. So, um, you know, one of the one of the top things we can do is help to publicize the clinical trials that are going to fit a, a broad range of patients and, and help to be clear about what those criteria for enrollment are. So, we often find that clinicaltrials.gov can be a little bit difficult to uh, read through and understand, especially for patients, but it's often difficult even for physicians. And so um, I I think maybe an effort uh, that that would allow us to try to resolve some of that is, is the first most important step. And I think that's exactly what the clinical trial finder is attempting to address. Um, but 
but you know, once we get beyond sort of even identification of a given trial for a patient, one of the one of the more difficult things that we often face is that there uh, there are a number of procedures and things that patients have to go through. There are travel requirements. Um, the visits are often more intensive than others, and so some people just don't feel they can they can make that all work with their schedule. So, um, what what I hope happens in the future, and what I we've heard the FDA say is that. You know, uh, companies that are running trials, uh, sites that are running trials should all make an effort to bring patients or patient advocates into the process of writing the protocol for the clinical trial and try to limit the number of things that are unnecessary uh, and take up a lot of extra effort for patients to be able to do. Um, one example I'll just point out is, you know, that we heard earlier is about getting repeat liver biopsies. and that is something that may feel completely unnecessary, but for, for certain clinical trials, that may be the most important thing that happens on the study. And so um, it, it's important, again, to have a conversation with the physician up front about what is the purpose of this biopsy? Why am I having it done? Does it help me or does it help other people later? And I think those types of conversations actually help people to make a decision about whether a trial fits them well. So I, I think having open and honest conversations about what is the purpose of the study, what are, how much is it likely to benefit me, is a, is a really important component of the conversation that doesn't always happen. I think people usually assume if they go on a trial, it's to help themselves, um, and they hope that it, it may help other people. But um, in many cases, things like the liver biopsy are actually to learn broader lessons that will help us you know, try to make that therapy more effective for a larger number of people in the future. So. Um, you know, mainly I, I, I would tend to focus on a clear way of identifying studies and having conversations with the sites that are running them as one major stumbling block. And then the other um, is trying to limit the things that are really complicated in studies as much as we possibly can to make them as easy for patients to enroll on as possible. Great, thank you so much for that. And I wanted to give, um, Dr. Nicholas and Winora, um, one more chance before we hop into questions um, to provide any last minute advice um, that they have for searching and or enrolling in a clinical trial. And um, Dr. Harry, if you have anything else to add to, please, please jump in. I think from my perspective as a caregiver and as someone who, who you know, worked the system to the best I, to the best I could, I think it's have have everything readily available as you're getting ready to apply. Have the copies of the CT scans, have the lab results, have, the, <clears throat> have a list. I used to just keep, keep it on my desktop, on my computer. And so every time I sent an email, I would, I would put that on the, on the email so that they, I would remind them. And I, and I think some of the reason why we got into some of the trials, honestly, was I was persistent. I was nice, I was pleasant, I was complimentary. Um, I wasn't aggressive, um, aggressively mean, but I, I would say I was, you know, firm about wanting to be in the trial and wanting the expertise and, and wanting to make sure that, and, and obviously we wanted to make sure we were right for the trial. I didn't want John enrolled in a trial that wasn't going to, that we knew from the bat wasn't going to help him. But, um, you know, a little, a little kindness goes a long way and um, having the information that you need readily accessible um, is very helpful to those who are making decisions about trials. So have all that information so that, that you have a really quick turnaround time um, when they're looking for data for your loved one or for yourself. Great, thank you. Uh, I'd like to add um, along with that, Reese, is that um, I would encourage uh, patients to download the Fight CRC Clinical Trials Finder app and look and see what's happening in the states that they live in. Um, for example, I have the clinical trials finder on my phone, and I, I just took a scroll and looked to see what was, what was going on in the state of Illinois, and currently there are about 52 trials being conducted in the state of Illinois that could possibly help late-stage patients. So that would be my encourage, is that number one, that they download that Fight CRC app. Um, it, it, it's very user-friendly. And then secondly, just make sure that they talk with their doctors and or, or clinical trial representatives uh, in, in their uh, clinical setting to tell them that this is something that they really want to do so that the medical staff can help guide their decision process as well. 
That's great. Thank you for that. Um, great advice from, from both of our um, speakers. And in the interest of time, I do want to jump to Q&A because we have some um, great questions coming in. Um, so again, thank you to all of our presenters. And I'm going to um, read out these questions. And then for all three of you, feel free to hop in um, on any insight you may have for um, a response. Um, so this question uh, says, I'm currently in maintenance mode. My doctor told me to wait until chemo stops working and tumors begin to grow again before starting clinical trials. How can I reconcile the two differing opinions I'm hearing? So I'll, I'll take it from the caregiver approach. And I, I think that um, stability is good. Um, it's nice to hear that you're stable, and um, and that's great. But it's not too early to start looking at options and being prepared for the next for for what if. Um, and so you know it creates uh, ski anxiety is a real thing, obviously. Um, and so that gave me an outlet before John's next set of scans to know what was next if we had growth or if this trial wasn't working. So. Um, I, again, I'm not giving a clinical opinion, but, you know, I think, again, growth is great, um, but just be prepared. And, um, and then if, if you're not, you know, if you, if, if things start to grow, then you know what, what the next thing is um, for you and what trials are out there and available, and you can react quickly to that. Great. Thank you, Dr. Nicholas. Um, here's another one. If a trial is working and the trial ends, does that treatment just stop then? What happens to the treatment afterwards? Um, I think I think the my experience is they'll continue with the trial. The the their the the investigators are more than happy to clinic to continue treatments in which a patient is seeing stability or seeing um, uh, shrinkage of tumors. So. I haven't had any experience where the treatment's working, I guess what we're stopping the treatment. I, I'm not aware that that really happens. Um, you know, they're just excited to see a, a treatment response. So I don't think that you have to worry about that, at least in my experience. I don't know if Dr. Here has had a different experience with that. Great, thank you for that. Um, let's see here. Our next question asks, how can we reach patients to let them know that their local oncologist won't usually know the latest and greatest clinical trial options? Most patients assume their oncologists know everything about what's happening in the field. Um, I, I think, again, from my perspective, I, I think, you know, it's, I don't want to say that your oncologist doesn't know what's happening. I want to say that there's so much happening that they can't possibly keep up. I, I mean, I think that's, I'd, I'd like to look at it from a, from that perspective. I think in general, um, you know, educate yourself, um, educate your friends. I mean, that's what, that's what our, our, um, our goal at fight CRC is to educate our, um, our patients and their advocates for um, all of the potentials. And we just need to keep at it. And I think we need to just keep, um, you know, educating, educating our patients. I, again, this five years ago, the treatments that we have available as clinical trials, some of them didn't, the thought didn't even exist. So we have to give our oncologists the benefit of the doubt. It's just not, it's not that they don't know. It's just, there's too much. There's literally too much to know. Um, and so, you know, I think, um, you know, be a, be a consumer, be an informed consumer and um, make sure that you can have a, you know, you can help them with what's happening. Um, my role at, at Fight CRC and my platform that I'm using is I'm going to start to educate and I'm going to hope to educate a lot of our local oncologists and, and our family doctors because I, as a family physician, I spend a lot of time talking with patients about their families or their cancer treatment. And so um, I'm going to continue to be that burning platform um, for our family doctors here in our community. Great, thank you. And hey, and Reese, I'd I'd like to sl slightly add to that as well. I really appreciate that uh, comment from 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 Dr. Angela, um, Andy. I'm sorry, um, because as a Lynch syndrome survivor, for me, it's not a matter of if I get another cancer; it's when I get another cancer. And 
when I get another cancer, I want to know that there are clinical trials out there that I have an option for. So again, just as mentioned, advocating for yourself or, or, or looking out there at clinical trials is the, the best route that you can take. Because as mentioned, it's not that your doctor may not care, it's just that they have so much that they, they their attention just can't be there. So for me, that will be my next option is uh, reviewing clinical trials when that um, time comes. Yeah, that's great perspective, Lenora. Thank you guys both for that. Um, I think you really do do hit the head, the nail on the head that the patient perspective and, and really making sure you all are um, voicing and having a voice in the process is, is extremely important. Um, we have one more question come in, and so we will make this our last. Um, this one asks, what other factors besides mutations and MSS, MSI status can help patients narrow down tr clinical trial options? Please, can you repeat the question? Sorry, you broke up a little bit. Sure, of course. It's, it asks, what other factors besides mutations and MSS, MSI status can help patients narrow down clinical trial options? I think I think that's a great place to start, but Dr. Curie is probably better a better expert at that from than me. So I will I'll let him respond to that. Yeah, yeah. So you know there are some standard prognostic indicators that have started to bubble up over the last few years in colorectal cancer um, that that are really going to be critical over the next few years. Um, some of those have been about the location of the primary mass, whether it's on the left side or the right side. Some of those have been about the presence of signaling pathways like BRAF. Um, we've known for years about KRAS, um, and, and we also know uh, now about something interesting that is uh, called RNA-seq profiling of tumors that has been correlated with certain tumor phenotypes. And those tumor phenotypes have turned out to be considerably important when it comes to predicting outcomes, in, uh, at least in a patient population and probably on a per patient basis. To date, those types of studies are not used. Oh, and there's one more that I think is super important called immunoscore, uh, where we actually look at the number of CD8 positive T cells, uh, sorry, CD3 positive T cells in the colon cancer to predict how patients might do in the future related to, to subsequent therapies. All of these things as they stand today um, we don't know exactly how to use them in a given person. However, if they're done uh, as a predictive marker or as an inclusion marker for a given clinical trial, they may become standard tests in the future that would allow us to more appropriately personalize therapy to a given patient. And so while those tests are not standard, um, one of the things that we can think about is to look for clinical trials that are using these tests, prognostic indicators, as selection criteria for the study. So um, it may actually give us much more insight into a given person's cancer in the future if, if we start to see those things used. They will be very similar, most likely, um, if they're borne out to be important, they would be very similar to something like MSI high or low um, and or RAS mutations and so on. So. Those are things that I look for over the next years that I think will be very, very critical um, and that most patients are not aware of yet, but, but many physicians in the field of colorectal cancer research are, are, are focused on and looking at. Great. Thank you so much. And with that, we are right at time, and I want to be um, mindful of everyone's schedule. So thank you again to our presenters, um, Dr. Harry, Dr. Nicholas, and Winora for spending um, your Tuesday morning with us going over clinical trials. We do have a few questions and comments um, that came in um, in the meantime, so I will follow up with them and then send those along to the presenters to get um, their insight into them. But again, thank you all so much for your time and we really appreciate you um, going through clinical trials with us. Um, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to reach out to me and I can reach out to the presenters. Thank you everyone and have a good day. Thanks, Reese. And if you post those Thank questions you. on Twitter, I'll try to answer them there too. Okay, that sounds great. Thanks so much.